I only have one rule. Everyone fights, no one quits. Welcome to WTC Squadcast, a podcast focusing on international metas, tournaments, communities, and the World Team Championship. The WTC is a proud partner of the T-Sports Network, Best Coast Pairings, and is sponsored by The Army Painter. If you'd like to support the podcast and the WTC, please visit our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash WTC Squadcast. Now, let's get on with the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the World Team Championships official podcast, the WTC Squadcast Into the Squad. In this podcast, we get a deeper insight to the individual teams and how they work and how they form themselves and what do they expect from the event. Today, we have Sean Naden, the captain of Team USA, as our guest, and we'll be talking with him about the current state of Team USA and what does the future mean hold for them. Hi, hello Sean. Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. So, do you, it is, uh, it is a, inter- it's the first time this podcast is, uh, this, at least this mini-series, is hosting one of the bigger teams so far. We only had, let's say, more exotic teams, more lesser-known teams, and this is one of the first times that Let's say more famous teams that are, that are coming on. So thanks for coming on for that. Oh, thank, no problem. Thanks for having me. I love the WTC. It's still hard for me to still. I yeah. Still, I still think of it as ETC. ETC uh, is easier to roll off the tongue as well. The the W is like it's too many vowels. Uh, so okay, so let's start then. When was the first time you heard of the WTC? Well, it's for ETC in the past though. Years and years ago, uh, I know maybe the second or third time that Ben Moley brought a team was when I started to really hear about it. And so maybe like the second or third year that America sent a team. That, well, that would be 2011 or 2012 then. I have my records in front of me as well, which I'll get to. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I'm not very smart with records, dates, or times. <laughs> uh, I can I can really count. Uh, it's like the USA has attended the event ten times. The first time was twenty ten, and it wasn't that impressive until your stewardship has taken hold uh, in twenty eighteen. So it's like the the best result was a third place in twenty eleven, and until that is like tenth or twelfth place, which is not something you'd expect Team USA to do. So uh, can you? Can you give me insight of how the team was formed before you and what did you make changes to make the team a winning team? So it was initially formed by Ben Moley and uh, a group of guys you know, who I believe had heard of it or knew of it through players they knew. And because there was no team, all they had to do was you know, apply to create the team and they formed it and they you know, picked some players and I think they added... Tony Kopak either that year or the next year, um, who was very young, wonderkin at the time, and <laughs> playing events. And then they formed a team, they took the players that they had, um, that, because that, again, at the end of the day, it is a very expensive proposition for us to go over, because uh, we can't just drive like a lot of the countries can, we have to, you know, fly a very long way. Um, so at first, I think it was you know players that knew Ben, played with Ben, um, or that he knew from big events, and they I think very quickly added like uh, qualifiers where I believe it was a big three event. What were the big three events at that time in America? Uh, um, Alveo. Adepticon. Adepti- it might have only been Adepticon or Nova. Like if you won Adepticon or Nova, you could get on the team. All oh, right. Um, I don't know that we had a big West Coast event yet at that at that junction. Um, though it may have been Bay Area Open or something. Or one of those. It, it might have been that too. Um, 
because it was pre-LVO days and stuff like that, so I know it wasn't like LVO was a qualifier. So that was what it was at first. I think that's how Brad first got on the team um, by winning Adepticon one year. Um, and so he started to go. And then Ben Moley passed the captainship to Gregory Sparks. And they continued in much the same way, picking veterans and voting veterans onto the team that had you know, done well or the highest scoring veterans or something like that, along with uh, a couple big event winners. Mm -hmm. And then the first major changes came under uh, Andrew Gagno, who was the next captain, um, and he instituted a qualification process where uh, four members would make the team um, from basically, think about the circuit scoring, ITC, similar thing, but he only counted events that had, you know, five rounds and over 50 people or something like that at the time, so that was how I first made the team. Um, there had been like some discussion the year before I made it on maybe, you know, adding me that year during um, like Greg Sparks' last captaincy year, but uh, so I made the team, and what do we say? Uh, where was it? If you tell me the location, I can tell you one. Prague? That would be 2015. Yeah. I believe that was my first year. Um, yeah. So that was how I made the team. With that system. And then... Fast forward to when I took over. Um, I felt the system was too constraining. Because now we had a bigger and bigger scene. We had more and more tournaments in the US. We had more and more visibility. The internet was bigger. You know... Uh, more more connectivity, you knew more of who the players were uh, that were good, but I felt the qualification system gave you some years where Grey Knights were the overpowered army that year, so everybody played Grey Knights and qualified for the team, but you know, only one person can play Grey Knights, right, in terms of the mm -hmm. WTC format. So if you have six Grey Knight players and well, you still got you gotta find five lists for those guys and maybe they haven't played anything, so I went with more of a subjective process where I, I just picked members and I tried to look at people doing well with different lists and you know talking to people and um, picking guys that I, I knew that were doing really really well along with that you know could maybe work together and you know have good chemistry as a team and along with that I also tried to make it because it was important to me I didn't want it to be uh, continue to be maybe like an old boys club or same guys go every year I tried to really reach out bring fresh teams year by year um, with some veteran presence because you do need that experience but the continuity from year to year make it more and more you know an experience because it's one of the you know most fun things I've experienced in 40k and I, I want people to have if you can only bring eight people a year if you brought the same six or seven year by year then no one knew would really get to experience it and I think it is just something really cool. And we have so many good players in America. We have such a huge, uh, growing, growing community that it, if you just brought the same people every year, it would get very stale and it wouldn't create any type of um, incentive for people to really reach out and you know try to make that leap. Yeah, that seems to be a running team, regardless of the community size or the player base, of, or essentially which country. It, that doesn't seem to be a simply tournament winning just at least flat meritocratic way when it comes to tournament success to form a team because this is a team event and the team needs to function not simply because of the factions you need eight players who who can get along as well as people yeah because i mean you have to ask some players to literally lose six seven games and it's very mentally draining and they're not if they don't feel like those losses are helping the team and that other people are like you know letting them down then they, they can't continue to go do that um, mentally it's, it's, very, it's very draining because um, if you think about it a lot of these guys that you picked for this team are used to winning five out of their six games when they go to every tournament they go to um, and winning events and stuff like that and if they don't have the mental strength to be like hey on this team this year I'm I'm the guy that's gonna go 
two and four or one and five. Like it's really really hard. Um, you're going to be the first. You're going to be the first defender every match, and you put if you win five points in any single game, that's a good success. It might be a hard thing to swallow for some players. Very much. All right. So that's that's interesting to see if to repeat it in even from small countries like uh, Luxembourg or Argentina to USA. It's like oh, this is a universal thing. Then this is not. Uh, you need to. Find eight people who are both good and who can take a loss like a champ. That is, that's that's an interesting team to notice. So, how do you form your team? Like, obviously, you don't have to give out all the details, but what do you consider in specifics when you form a team? Um, I think I touched on it a little bit. You did, but I would like to delve in it a bit more, if that's okay. Um, like I said, I look at it first as maybe I look at the team from the year before and where there's some guys that, you know, showed, you know, real good grit that we want to bring back. Sometimes I even cycle players from player to coach um, so we can continue to bring experience and leadership uh, values to the team even if they're not going to play that year. Um, I then, so once you have a couple of veterans and you know you have that leadership and you look at, okay, what what new players are coming on the scene that are really, really skilled, but you know maybe have only won a couple events, or maybe they've won something big. Um, maybe they they did win the ITC. Like we had, a, we were going to bring uh, Siegler of the year, and he had just come out. He had just only played really that one year, but we, you know was still a, a good player to add. He, he was uh, just you know dominating that a year and, and, and stuff like that. And so you look at players that maybe necessarily don't play in a lot of big events uh, but are really good um, because you know them and you've seen them play and you, you, you understand that like maybe they can't travel to, for, to every event because of you know family or job structure but you know if you know them and you play them you can have that and um, keep it open to new experiences and people reach out to me um, from time to time, and then once they reach out, then I know maybe that they're thinking about the team, and then I follow what they are doing on, you know, their tournaments and what lists they're playing and how their style is. And I talk to people that that know them. And I'm like, okay, what's what's their mental makeup, and you know, what what is this? Like, how are they playing? And, mm -hmm. if, and then when you start to get six players on the team, then you really you really start to look at, okay, this is the lists that these players play what other armies do I need, what other armies do I want, and then that, then you can focus to pick those last couple players uh, because you, you're maybe looking for like some specialists, um, some guys that really love an army and do, you know, like say if your nids are bad that year, but you, you're like, oh, well, I need a seventh or eighth list, and I think nids are decent in teams more than their championships. Let me look at for some tiered players that, you know, have been sticking to it and going four and two, you know, at, at events with Tyranids and or et cetera, et cetera, and, and pick those guys up to, to, to flesh out the full team. Okay, so that, yeah, it's actually start with the good core, and then you have, like, considerations of new people, who, or specialists, or both, or team players, so it, as expected, it is a very, it's not really straightforward, and it is a bit hard to explain, so I understand that. Yeah, and then you always have to have a couple guys in your back pocket that, like, because every year you have players drop, or you know, the, the tragic year we, um, where we lost Jeff. Um, you always have to have some guys that are just willing to step up at the last minute, maybe like a month before the event, and play whatever. Because maybe lists are already submitted, and they have to jump in and play something. Or, you know, last minute they have to be, oh, okay, you're gonna play. Every other army is taken, but you, you're gonna play this. Um, can I trust you to, you know? Do it for me. Um, so you have a couple guys like that are that are always like on your on your radar um, to be like last minute alternates and stuff like that. Yeah, that's and it's it is always uh, interesting to not interesting, but it was sad about Jeff and it was it was a well I cannot say really much else because it's it, it's simply a sad thing and it is it was a good thing to see the community your the USA community get together 
uh, about that and it was it is what it is but to move things forward because that was a while ago and well whatever uh, I don't want I don't want to sound callous by the way I just simply don't have much to say about that um, so I I have some other questions, but they are not really applicable in this situation. For example, we I usually ask about the community in your country, but USA community has such a big spotlight on it that everybody knows who are the good players, and there's no really hidden secret in the USA community. And uh, so, so there's no. It's in, for example, in the Polish community, nobody knows the players from outside, but in in the USA everybody is known and one else thing I would like to ask do you, what do you plan to achieve with the next WTC like do you have a placement in mind where you consider success like this would be good if this result would be good for us um, I think uh, every year that I've been captain I think the goal has been to win uh, we won the year um, the first year I was captain, uh, I felt we had the team that could win the next year. Um, Jeff passing through a little bit of a wrench in that. Um, I feel, still feel like we were right there. We were close enough to do it. Um, we still got a very good result with sixth place. Yeah, and I so I feel every year I think we're at, we're right there. We have, we have proven that we can we can compete. So I always feel that winning is the goal and. You know, doing our best within that within that goal is 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 is, is, is what we're doing, gonna do. Okay, so so you know, obviously anything anything less than first is not good enough, from my understanding. I mean, not that's not true. Cause everything <laughs> is really good. Um, so I don't look at that. I don't look at that as at, at GTS when I go for singles. I mean, obviously I have the capability to win most every. GT I walk into as a personal player. Oh, I don't look at it as a not success if I don't win. Such so humility. Uh, no, it's, uh, no, I agree with you. It's and if that, it really doesn't work if you if you I'm I'm just being a jest because if you you can't really accomplish because it is a dice game after all. There are there are games where you do everything right but. Simply, you fail a two in charge, three in charge with rolling a double one twice, and that is what it is in certain cases. Yeah, I think there's a couple teams that have shown a pattern of success: Poland, Germany, um, England, uh, Russia, Australia, and um, while well, Australia hasn't broken through and won yet, um, the Swedes have won before. Uh, I think America is right there with, with all those teams as we look at it each year as we can win this. Um, we have to show up, we have to play our best, we have to get our pairings right, and you know, we, we're right there with those teams as, you know, as capable of winning any year we come. Yeah. So you mentioned that some of the challenges of forming the team included the logistical aspects because it is not really, like, even though America is one of I mean, it is decently, it is economically doing all right, although at least better than other countries. And how big of a challenge is the the economics, the simple economics of it? Like, do you think the international it's, trip? It's it's a big challenge. Um, okay, that's interesting. You know, every player has to spend several, you know, thousand dollars to go over and, and, and play in the event. And then furthermore, it's, it's a very big challenge logistically, just on things like team practice. Like we, our, our team doesn't get together very much for practice, even once it's selected. Maybe, you know, one weekend, maybe two with some of the teams. Uh, that's a big factor in terms of just traveling within our own country is expensive and people live far apart. Um, whereas uh, other countries can all you know, maybe drive to one central location a couple hours and and, and practice. Um, we have team members that could be six, seven hours away by airplane. Um, and 
that you know doesn't breed an ability to just get together multiple times to heading into the event to, to practice and do those kinds of things. So we have to do a lot of you know remote learning and you know talking and you know expecting people to practice in their own right and maybe getting together a couple times with with guys. Um, this year, I feel less of a disadvantage on that because um, the WTC is playing book missions, um, or we've played book missions before, but we're playing the same missions that the Americans are playing in tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, which is never, which has never ever been the case. Before. Yeah, the, we finally synchronized on that after after quite a while. So that would that would always be the biggest variable is that we would have players that I mean would never even look at the WTC missions until the practice weekend and then be like they'd have come in with their list and be like oh my list doesn't play this mission well and we're like yeah that's why we keep telling you that but you weren't practicing the missions with your buddies because you're always going to just practice for your tournaments so this that is I think a big factor in um, you know. A, reach the learning curve a little bit more for, our, for our, our newer players that have not been to the event and we in the last five years have added more and more um, five man but team style events so that we have more and more guys that have some experience in you know sacrificing and stuff like that so those two factors I think are, are a big help for us. Okay so do you uh, do you essentially do practice on TTS the does the prelo the use of TTS has changed the things, or is it still the same as before? Um, I've not touched TTS at all. Um, oh, okay. It, it has no, it has no bearing for me. We have a couple guys um, on the team this year that are, aren't allowed. I mean, I'm sure they could do it privately, but they're not allowed to do it like ah, publicly. From cer um, let's say from certain legal restrictions. Yes. Okay. So that's why we've been approached by several teams for like cross team practice, but we're not we're not going to participate because some of our players can't, and I refuse to. I mean, it doesn't. I understand it's a powerful tool for people, and especially if you live far away or in other countries to play with. But at the end of the day, um, it doesn't appeal to me as a gaming thing because I play this game to paint my models and play with the models that I painted. So yeah. I've just not touched it. I agree with you one hundred percent. I haven't touched the, as a player so far to TDS, and I think this game is not good enough to not play on table. It's like mm -hmm. it's uh, I, there are better computer games, and I if, right. it, if I'm going to play a computer game, I'm going to play a real computer game. <laughs> yeah, no, not not this. I was like, if it is the best, the best aspect is the face to face aspect. That you have to like, there's a person in front of you. This is not. This is not an online game where you communicate with chat. You talk with that person. You interact with them. You spend at least three hours with that guy or gal, and yeah, you, hi you, hi you high five, you cry together, you you laugh. And there are there, I have been on dates that are that were shorter than that. So I mean, this is it is a commitment where for several hours, and especially if it's a longer tournament, you spend a whole weekend with with people in the same hall and you enjoy the atmosphere together and that is what makes what makes 40k yeah, special the, commu the community aspect is what really uh, drives it for me um, uh, I love competing but if the community if it was the community was super toxic or whatever it wouldn't be probably still doing it um, the community is really great and that's like I said one of the things I've really loved about WTC as well is meeting people from other countries that, you know, enjoy this hobby. And so then I see those guys or talk to those guys in my free time, um, whenever I can talk to Adam from Australia or whatever, um, or Neil, I, you know, I love hearing from them, talking to them, learning about them, their families, and, and talking about 40K together. And that's really one of the things where I've really tried and driven to have you know, newer and newer people, like, even after the year we won, um, members of the team were like, oh, aren't you going to bring the same team back we just won? And I was like, no, it gives me even more incentive to bring totally new people, um, because, you know, you all have the world championship now, I don't, I don't have to get, get you anything else anymore, you know, I delivered that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're done, you're, so you're ready to go, so you do whatever. You know, you, you have that forever, um, I want 
other people to be able to have that too. Yeah, that, that's good to know, and I agree with you fully. It's it's it is a meme, but it's the real championship of the WTC was the friends we made along the way. It's so that is good, and it's not that easy. No, it's not that common to say. Oh, I. I met with a Norwegian, an Australian, a Japanese, and a Argentinian at the same table, and we talked and drank and talked about the same thing. And although our lives are so different, that in every aspect imaginable, we have a common aspect we share, that is 40k in this case, and that is that's like I have seen people who couldn't speak the same language, like. I think it was a French and a Spanish guy who couldn't speak a single word of English still communicate perfectly well for three hours playing 40k and I don't think that is possible in many things that's beautiful yeah, it's, it's amazing it's like you know you may not be the best conversationalist or know what to do but like when you're hanging out with somebody for 40k you can at least always talk about how how much you hate Tao or <laughs> <laughs> like, like, uh, like talk about people's each each other's models and compliment like you know how they built something or how they painted it. And, well, like you know. Magnus doing many things wrong. It's no exactly. No, I mean, he did so many things wrong, and everybody is Alfarius and Dawn is better than Perturbo. These are the things that like. Almost the the game becomes like the table. The game on the table becomes secondary to the community and how people uh, enjoy each other's company. Essentially, uh, uh, so you mentioned that you do you have you mentioned that you keep changing the players on purpose. Do you have a uh, do you have an idea for the twenty twenty two team? I know you had. The 2020 team formed and you pushed it to 2021 but i don't remember if you decided to keep the 2022 team as the 2021 team uh yeah i've kept um most of it there's a couple of players that you know have communicated to me that they're you know, I've communicated to them they haven't really been playing in that edition so i'll, I'll find replacements for them mm -hmm. but so i think i have six players at the moment and um, you know, gonna see what we need in the next month or so, and fill those last two spots uh, into the new year. So you're planning to be done with everything before the new year starts? Yeah, because if you think about it, um, lists are due what June? Late June, like early. We might put pull it back to early June. Maybe we'll see about how what the captains want. But it is usually late June. Yeah, it's usually late June for an August event. Um, if you don't kind of have guys mostly locked in by like January, February, they in America they may have already decided to book vacations and use up all their vacation time. Um, various other reasons. You really do need to have it done um, by like late January, early February, um, at least for your main team. Maybe a couple guys would, would have mm -hmm. to be alternate or something. Somebody had to pull out last minute um, for various reasons. And so, yeah, and then you really want to be able to have guys start, you know, not focusing on the same army anymore and what's good and at least maybe bringing different things or playing different things. So, yeah. so getting a couple months to start play testing various builds or various ideas back and forth because... Uh, you gotta kind of pick them by, you know, May-ish, maybe last minute, um, and then and then submit the lists and get all that stuff done. I I expect you already have a very good idea of who you want to pick for the for the rest of the team. Um, no, I don't. All right. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I fly by the seat of my pants a little bit. Um, everyone knows that, but this is, um, yeah, but uh, I feel really good. The six players I have right now, I think, are very strong. Okay, that's good to hear. 
uh, so Matt, let's say you got two players that right, the, the rest of the, the other two players are at the same cult as your six. Where do you think you would place? I'm not saying where do you want to place. Obviously, you are coming to win, but what would be your estimate of Team USA ending up? Um, well, I think we're going to win. Ah, that's confidence. Confidence. You heard it here first. <laughs> 17 months out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's obvious. I mean, Team USA is always the... It's a top team, and I... To be honest, I was I would be a bit surprised if you said, "Oh, I think we, I think a top three finishes would be good." I would be surprised if you said that. So it's this is not actually a. I think it is fine. Uh, okay, so, but one more thing. This is not just team success. This is more like about you and your WTC experience. Can you describe what you would like to see in an ideal WTC event? This is not just what is on the table. This can be anything about the event itself. I think I think we've really come a long way the last couple of events that I attended. Um, I really loved uh, Croatia. Loved playing in the stadium that, with you know good terrain, and the terrain was continued again in um, in Serbia. I remember. When we played one year, I can't remember. I feel like there was like a toy castle on the table. Ah, that would be Spain. Yeah, 2017. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to call it out. I knew where it was. But uh, no, no, no. I, I, <laughs> look, I'll be. I'll. 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 I'll take the hit on the Spain event. I was. I was. I was a chairman for that event as well. But it was like. I was sort of left alone. So I blamed a few other people. But it's like, and the Spanish guys. They they wanted to try their best, but they. When they got the event, they didn't know what the challenges were. So it's like, oh, we are going to order, we will borrow some terrain from this guy and he'll ship it and it will, it'll be here Wednesday of the event where the team event will start Friday. It's like, and they didn't even know what terrain was coming. So yeah. Uh, but I am. Okay, so, so I cut you off. You were saying your ideal WTC. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know, I, I really like the direction we've gone, um, you know, everybody, I think, I think the, the council by you guys, Tom, Neil, and, and such, and your idea to put it in one location to have, you know, better train, better rates, you know, better, you know, hotel setups and all that, I think that is the direction it has to go, um, I think that's the best direction for it. And we'll see what happens. Obviously, from I understand how some people want a vacation in different countries and, and, and enjoyed that aspect of it. But most years when we've gone, we've visited another country and then traveled to the event, or after the event, traveled to another country. So I mean, you can still have that that aspect of the vacation stuff even mm -hmm. if it's in the same country each year. Um, I think I think that'll be the big thing to make it you know, better and bigger and, you know, more streamable. I think the uh, whip around coverage that some events are doing now with multiple table cameras and switching back and forth is, is, is super necessary in a team event. And one, one low quality stream is not enough because you're showing one table, like that doesn't give you the, uh, the impact that like the, the full, full, the full eight man team is, is, is doing or doing well or doing, you know, quarters or something like that. Yeah, but we this that's one of the things that especially Tom is really Tom and Neil especially they really want to improve on and that's why we partnered up with the Honest War Wargamer and Rob and the TSN and uh, it's like they're they're working hard on trying to get an event with exactly what you said. Eight tables, everybody every table has a camera, several cameras possibly, every table has a a person who takes notes and relays the info, so it's full on coverage if possible. That that's what we're going for. So, well, okay. That well, if that is it, if you have any shout outs, you can give them now. And I think we, I think this was a very nice conversation. Other than that. Huh? Shout outs. 
No, no, no. I decided nobody. to finally go. I've been missing Maybe. it for two years. Yeah, well, hopefully not for any more, and 2022 will be the great return of the team international team tournaments, because this is not... the two years was not really that fun. Okay, well, thanks for coming on, and I'll hopefully we'll, I'll see you in person in August next year. Thank <laughs> you.